Uh, that's who she's always been to me, and uh, that's how I will refer to her. And uh, I'm sure that her brother Jerry, she's always been Wilma to him, and that may be how he refers to her, but she is Sister Barker to us and forever will be. We'd like to bow your heads. We'll have a moment of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to come and celebrate uh, the passing of a soldier, a soldier of faith, active and effective in the kingdom of God in a manner that only eternity can tell. God, I pray that everything that's said or done here today will be for your glory and to commemorate the work and the glory that you have manifest in her life and in the ministry that she so faithfully adhered to. I pray, God, that you'll let every heart and mind be touched and be blessed. I pray for strength, courage, and wisdom to say the right things. And I pray, God, that you'll bless uh, Brother Jerry as he pays tribute to his sister. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wilma Barker passed away October 27, 2021 at her home in Lilburn at the age of 83. She was born July 13, 1938 in Butler Township, Pemiscott County, Missouri, to the late Neville and Ida Lois Stover Hurley. That's just brother and sister Hurley to all of us. And I was telling uh, Sister Pam, even though they've been gone quite a few years, and whoever happens to live on the corner of Kings Highway and Mott Street live in brother and sister Hurley's house still yet and uh, um, that's how it will always be referred to in my mind but she was married to Carl Barker who preceded her in death in 2013 since 1967 she was a member of the Pentecostal Church in New Matter, Missouri having taught Sunday school classes for over 50 years she was a teacher in the Portageville School District and North Pemiscot School District survivors include her daughter Pam and husband Wimpy Henry of Lilburn, Missouri, her son Jeffrey Keith and his wife Andrea Barker of Bloomfield, Missouri, one sister Norma Hurley Davis and Doyle Davis of New Madrid, her brothers Jerry Hurley of North Carolina and Jimmy and Barbara Hurley of Texas. He had, she had 11 grandchildren, 25 great-grandchildren and one great-great-granddaughter. She was preceded in death by her parents her husband, and one brother, Johnny Hurley. I have a, a couple of things to take care of in the absence of uh, first one of her great-grandsons, Waylon, wrote a note and asked for Brother GL to read it. And it says, I hope you have a great heaven time. I'm going to miss you, Granny. And he wrote, have a great time in heaven. That's a precious little thing from Waylon. And uh, uh, he's uh, not able to be here. And, uh, but he loved his Granny. And then uh, my aunt, my mom's sister, Barbara Sue, uh, is unable to be here. She and Sister Pam have been friends for quite a long time and she is unable to be here today due to uh, uh, an illness and she wrote a poem and asked that I read that today as well and it's a very beautiful poem and I hope I can read it in the cadence with which it is intended said a sweetness left the earth today a precious saint we all will say she strove with patience and meekness and love never to offend anyone or heaven above. I want my Lord to be satisfied with me. I want my life to be what he'd have me be. For when I come to that great eternity, I want my Lord to be satisfied with me. It was her anthem because she sang it and lived it. And I'm sure today in the heavens above, reunited with those whom she loved, the celebration is endless as we know because today she's walking on streets of gold. And that's a beautiful poem that Aunt Barb wrote. I will today for just a few moments uh, 
share some thoughts uh, from my mind and my life of Sister Barker. She was a servant to many in the kingdom of God, and she single-handedly planted the seeds of salvation in countless boys and girls throughout the last 50-plus years. She became a Sunday school teacher very soon after making this her church home. And uh, in 1967, she and uh, Brother Barker made this their church home, and she became a teacher very soon after. And she served in that capacity as long as she was able. For at least 52 years, she was a Sunday school teacher. And uh, I uh, had told Sister Pam on more than one occasion um, she can keep being a Sunday school teacher if we have to roll her into the room and just let her sit there because she earned that right. Um, I had the privilege of having her as my Sunday school teacher in or around 1978, 1979, and I have now served as her pastor for the past nine years. Many of the songs and lessons that she taught us uh, remain with me today. Matter of fact, at least one of these songs I can't think of without seeing her. Uh, those that didn't know Sister Barker until the last few years maybe didn't get to see her as active as she was. But every one of these Sunday school songs, she acted them out, the entire song, very demonstratively in our class. And uh, I, songs like, uh, um, we'll roll the old chariot along, and uh, we won't lag on behind. And we loved when we got to run the devil over. Anybody remember that? We got to really, we would just roll the old chariot along, but when we got to run the devil over, boy, she let us just get down, and sometimes we'd run the devil over for several minutes. Uh, and, uh, of course, no one could be, in Sister Barker's class without learning I'm in the Lord's army. And uh, Peter, James, and John in a sailboat. And one of my fondest memories of being in Sister Barker's class is we always had a Christmas program back in the day. And truth is, in hindsight, it, it wasn't a real elaborate program, but she would write our part on an index card like paper and uh, most of the time a Bible verse, sometimes several parts of a poem or something, but uh, she would give it to us and we were supposed to memorize it. She didn't have much faith in us memorizing it. So she would stand over in the, in the other church about where the serving line is now is where the platform stood and and Sister Barker would stand there right by the edge because we were little kids. And, and, and uh, I'll get back in the microphone in a second. But it, it would be a little stand right there, similar to that with the microphone. And, uh, and we would uh, recite our scriptures. Truth is, we didn't memorize them. And Sister Barker would stand right there by the edge and she would whisper to us every word we're supposed to say, kind of on the slick because she wanted it to seem like we did it, but she didn't trust us to do it. And uh, so she would tell it to us, even though we had practiced several times. And, um, uh, my dad taught me my first scripture, the ever-powerful and applicable apostolic, Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But Sister Barker taught me my second Bible verse that I ever memorized, and it struck a powerful chord with me. It's Matthew 1 and 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. It opened this little boy's mind. Um, you, you, many of you knew my dad and and and. I probably won't talk about it much, but Daddy and Brother Barker were really close. And uh, uh, <laughs> I was talking, this is about Sister Barker, not Brother Barker. I may have mentioned it at his funeral, but 
Amanda told me that uh, he hugged her all the time. And then he got to thinking in his mind he was going to make me upset because he was hugging on my wife. And so he came and asked her, and he said, you think Brother G.L. will be mad for me hugging on you? And she said, no, he's, he's not. But then he started hugging on me all the time, and then sometimes he'd kiss me. And uh, I didn't mind. And then he, as, as Brother Barker started fading a little bit, and this is my point, he thought I was my dad. And he'd call me Brother Gary, and then he would realize it. And that's, that's the highest compliment anybody could pay me anyway. But uh, Brother Barker was very close to my dad, and our, our families were very close. And my dad was an incredible teacher. And, of course, we had Brother McKinney. But I can't tell you how Sister Barker was able to connect with me as a little kid on the beauty of this great message we have that we love. And I got it when Sister Barker taught me, and we'll call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. It opened this little boy's mind to the powerful truth that Jesus was God. It was prophesied by Isaiah, and it was fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. Thank goodness. And I mentioned this to her brother Jerry earlier this morning. Thank goodness. I say this very facetiously and tongue in cheek. Sister Barker was not a Sunday morning babysitter. But she took the calling of Sunday school teacher very seriously and very literally. And the time and the effort she invested in us has shown a return. There's been a return on her investment. Brother and Sister Barker were constant in our lives and in our church. I remember visiting them when they lived in Portageville. And uh, Daddy and I went down there really late one night for some reason. And I was really sleepy. But here come Brother Barker out to the truck. And um, they, they were part of our lives. And I might say this just to throw it out there for us today. We didn't have a life other than church. Church was our life. And our church people were our family. And, uh, and certainly hope that we can in some way revive that ideology. We were taught to respect all adults. We were always guilty till proven innocent. If grown-ups told on you, you did it. That's just how we were raised. But our Sunday school teachers had a special category of respect. And I'm thankful for that. It was September the 1st, 2014. It's a day I'll never forget as long as I live. We had a Labor Day picnic just across the street right behind you there at the, at the pavilion. We had a ton of food. There were people everywhere. I was cleaning up and I was taking the trash out. And truth of the matter is, what had started out as a great idea to have a Labor Day picnic, and it started out as a lot of fun, had all of a sudden turned into a lot of work and I was ready for it to be over. It was messy, it was hot, it was nasty and I was bent over the grill trying to clean up a little bit and somebody hollered, Brother Gio, you need to come here. The truth is, I was aggravated. I had things to do, I had things to clean up. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Everybody's out there playing and having a good time and here I am having to work. Somebody said, Brother GL, you need to come here. I stopped what I was doing and had my cap on and a black shirt and khaki pants, and I remember it well. And I wasn't very happy just to go see what was going on. But when I got there, Sister Barker wasn't feeling well. And everything changed. I wasn't frustrated anymore. And as I approached her, she slumped and fell over. Sister Maria was holding on to her, and she felt her breath escape from her body, and she said, she's gone, she's gone. Sister Pam stood there, as any of us would, not really knowing what to do. Um, I uh, had the privilege of working at the funeral home, and I've seen quite a few people that have passed away, and Sister Barker was gone. One eye was shut, one eye was open, it was fixed. 
she wasn't breathing. And the truth is, and I shared this with Brother Jerry as well, I cannot tell you that there was a conscious thought that said we ought to pray. It wasn't there, but we did. Without thinking about it, without any preconceived ideas, I just laid hands on her chest right here on her shoulders, right where her pads are. And I began to pray. And can I tell you folks that Jesus Christ showed up at our Labor Day picnic and there was a move of God like I have not felt in my life. We had a missionary, Brother Dominguez from Peru. He joined in very quickly and before we knew it, everybody all around us was praying and and we had guests that day who do not attend our church. And uh, they were there, right, front row seat. But I promise the goodness before God Almighty, just as calm as you please, I looked at her stomach and it rose up and went down. And in about five seconds, her eyes popped open. And she sat up. Of course, we're still going to try to take care of her. We called the ambulance, and they took her to the ER, and not only did they found nothing wrong that why she would have died, they didn't find anything why she would have passed out or anything why she would have been sick at all. There was nothing wrong with her. God raised her up. It was a miracle. No one who was present that day would think anything otherwise. The power of God brought Sister Barker back to us. And kept her for nearly seven more years. It was at the death of Lazarus. With the finality of the closing of death's door slamming shut in their minds. Mary and Martha said, Jesus, you came just a little too late. If you could have been here on time, you could heal the sick. But our brother's gone. And uh, everybody knows when you die, it's all over. In his response... His response to Martha's declaration, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And she underestimating the power of God. She thinks he's referring to the resurrection of the last day and Jesus was not. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. In the mind of Jesus Christ, death is just sleep. It's temporary. It's no different than a sickness for him. Jesus didn't come that we might have hope only in the life to come, eternal life, but he also came that we might have hope in life here. It's an abundant life filled with purpose and opportunities to touch another life. That's what we're here for. We're not here so that we can be blessed, but so that we can be a blessing. Now, Sister Barker was not perfect. I won't pretend she is. And if I was fortunate enough to speak at the funeral of every person here, there's not a one of us that's going to be called perfect when we pass away. She was stubborn. And not always in a blessed, beautiful, sweet little Sunday school teacher way. Sometimes she was ornery stubborn. And, uh, but it was that perseverance, that stubbornness, that refused to allow her to give up. I think it's safe to say, Sister Pam, she, she probably lasted three days longer than she even should have because she wasn't going to go. Not till she was ready. She persevered. How in the world did she get a bachelor's degree and become a school teacher having never had a driver's license? Relying on people to take her places. Brother Barker used to carry her everywhere in the country. Anything she was, Sunday school class, the Christmas practice, everything. Here he brought her. He brought her way long after he should have been bringing her places. But Sister Barker was going to do what she was called to do and who she was called to be. Sister Barker filled her purpose in life. God has blessed our church with a great revival. We often have people worshiping with us that I don't know where they came from. I don't know their name. The seats will be full. People receiving the Holy Ghost, being baptized, and greater things are coming. The present leadership of this church, myself included, and the future leadership of this church, 
will reap the harvest of seeds planted from the mouth, the mind, and the spirit of Sister Wilma Barker. I may never march with the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I can see her. How many of us were in her class? Can you see her? She, I didn't even really know what that was back then, but I knew Sister Barker was in it. <laughs> Ride in the cavalry, march with the infantry, shoot the artillery. Boy, y'all remember we liked that one. Sometimes we would shoot the artillery like five times before we could move on to the next one. I may never fly or the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. It's a kitty song for Sunday school, but it's who Sister Barker was. She fought in the army of the Lord. She fought the way that a child of God is supposed to fight, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. She served well. She fought hard. She planted much and has seen it come to more. Thank you, Sister Barker. Thank you, Sister Pam and Keith, for sharing your mama with the kingdom of God. I am a life she touched, and I am a life she has changed. And to use Sir Isaac Newton's quote that I have often used and yet use it again, if I can ever see far, it's because of the shoulder of the giants upon which I stand. And Sister Barker is one of those giants. Thank you for the opportunity to share today. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Brother GL, for those words and I want to thank you for uh, giving uh, me the privilege of being up here and share in uh, this celebration of life. I've been in ministry for 56 years. I have certainly partic participated in a lot of uh, funerals, uh, but I must say that this is the biggest honor that I have to be able to share uh, today. This church has been very important to my family. Uh, and what uh, uh, you do not know, Brother GL, is I got my sp first speaking gig 
here at this church. I was three years old. There was a Christmas program, and uh, I had a speaking part in it. And my mother said that I had a sweater on, and as I spoke, I began to roll that sweater. And when I got through, it was up here. <laughs> but that launched my preaching uh, career and ministry, and I'm so thankful uh, for the Pentecostal Church of uh, New Madrid. Uh, this is a celebration of life, and I was searching for scripture that uh, maybe could speak uh, to this life that we are uh, here celebrating, and I had to go to Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 31, uh, and uh, I, I really, are, I'm not going to read it all. I, I'm going to read uh, verse 10, because Solomon wrote, who can find a virtuous woman for her worth? is far above rubies. And of course, he wrote uh, other things that she would be doing. But I want to go down to verse 29. It says, many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord she shall be praised. And I just believe that that, uh, that speaks very well of Wilma Barker. And then Paul wrote in the New Testament, he said, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race, and I have kept the faith. And that certainly speaks well of the life and the death of Wilma Barker. That's sort of awkward for me. She was always sister. See, in my family, when my older brother John came along, he was brother. And that he was brother until he died. And then Wilma came along and she was sister. And Wednesday, when I told her goodbye, I called her sister. I think it wasn't until Norma came along that my mom and dad found names. Uh, so uh, we knew them as brother and sister. So to honor her uh, today, I will be referring to sister. And that is, um, uh, that's an honorable name. And by the way, uh, a few years ago, a gentleman came to me and he said, uh, I, I'm about to end my life. It's, it's about over for me. He was in his late 80s. And he said, I've written down how I want my funeral. And on that piece of paper, he said, no funeral should last over 30 minutes. Well, folks, that's not going to happen here. We're here for the long haul because there's a lot to say about this uh, great lady uh, that uh, lived uh, her life, not perfectly, but she lived it as she felt the Lord was calling her to do. Uh, she grew up uh, as a sharecropper's daughter. We, uh, we were on cotton farms, and, and she worked hard, just like all of us did, as you can imagine. Uh, she was a really pretty, red-headed freckle-faced girl. As a boy, I thought I had two beautiful sisters, and um, she, she just, um, uh, she was pretty, as you saw the pictures earlier. Uh, when, as sharecroppers, we moved a lot because uh, my folks were hard workers, and so we would, uh, we would move quite often. And I can still remember her when we would pull up to, uh, to the new house that we would be living in, she would walk around the yard, and she would pick up pieces of glass and rocks and whatever else that she could find, and she, that was her collection, and she put those in, uh, in her spot, and you better not touch anything that she had. Uh, she was a collector. Uh, 
And though we were poor, and though, though we worked hard, um, we also had times of laughter. And I want to share some of those times with you uh, today. Um, Jimmy uh, was the baby, and I was next youngest. So that meant that we had two older sisters, and I am told that they dressed us up in dresses and played dolls with us. Now, Jimmy turned out pretty normal, but that might explain some of the things that my family would say about me. And one time, Sister Norma got off the school bus, and they saw a chicken out in the middle of the road that had just been run over. And they decided that they wanted chicken for supper. And so they started cleaning that chicken. But they didn't realize that you need to put that chicken in some hot water and pull the feathers off. They thought you skinned the chicken. And so there they were out in the yard uh, just pulling and tugging at the skin on that chicken and I can't remember, I'm not for sure whether we had chicken for supper or not, but I, I have my doubts about that. And, and I couldn't tell our story as kids without telling about the apple trees. We, we had some apple trees behind our house. And in the fall, there was always a salt shaker that was in the trunk of one of those trees, and we would climb up there and eat those green apples. I don't know if any of you have ever eaten green apples before. Uh, we had many a bellyache because of that, but we enjoyed the apples. We enjoyed playing uh, on the farm and in the barns. And Jimmy reminded me this week about our first telephone. Uh, in, in the barn loft, uh, on James Smith's place, uh, we uh, uh, found a box of dynamite in the, in the uh, barn loft, and we had to move that. We were told not to touch it, but we moved that so that we could build some forts. And we built two forts, and Jimmy and one of the girls got in one fort, and the other girl and I got in the other fort, and then we got two tin cans. And we strung a string between those tin cans, and that was our telephone. We talked uh, with each other uh, with uh, those cans, and I'm uh, not sure we could hear anything, but that was our first telephone, and that just shows how much fun that, that she was as a, as a young girl. She was probably 13 at that time, and... Uh, I'm glad she finally admitted this next story that I have to tell you. And I, I have to preface it by saying that if it is possible for somebody to come back from the dead and haunt you, I'm in trouble. But I'm going to tell this story anyway. You see, as kids, we stole cigarettes from my dad. And um, he was always confused because he thought somebody else did it. He didn't know how they found his hiding spot. But we knew where it was, and we would get that pack of cigarettes, and we would go out in the cotton field and hunker down there, and, and we smoked. But all through the years when we talked about that, Brother Gio, she said, I didn't smoke. <laughs> and it was just a few weeks ago that... Uh, she told Pam, yes, I smoke cigarettes. And I'm sure glad she admitted that and repented of it before <laughs> she died. So as you can see, sister and all of us kids had a great childhood. And she was the woman she was because of the foundation that we had at home and um, it was just a wonderful, wonderful time uh, growing up, and I am certainly going uh, to miss her. 
and Greg is going to sing right now. Heaven's now my home. She is a, more alive today than she's ever been. When she breathed her last breath in this life, she breathed her first breath in eternity. She's left us a great example. Follow in the matter of her faith, and her family, and her friends. Sister was a person of faith. You see, it took a lot of faith for her to get through the past few years. The times of suffering, uh, it, it, it was just hard, and it took faith for her to just endure the pain. And she did it because she had a faith that was lasting. She became a member of this church many years ago. And she served the Lord well because of her faith. Brother GL did a great job of explaining the impact she's had on so many people. And she did it because one day she realized that she needed to prepare uh, for the day that uh, she would leave this life and go into eternity. And at that time, she made her plans for when she would breathe her last breath here. You see, heaven is a real place. And when believers 
die, we say, well, they've gone on. But heaven says, here they come. There's a welcoming party for us. And the Apostle Paul says, for when we're absent with the Lord, we're or absent in this body, we're present with the Lord. And she understood the importance, not only of having faith, but of passing that faith on to others. It was her faith that helped her to have a, a peace as she went from this life into the life in eternity. Five years ago, I spent almost a week uh, with her, and we had a wonderful time as we drove around the country and saw the farms that we used to live on and just reminisced. But it's during that time that she also talked about her faith, and she talked about loving the Lord, and she talked about teaching Brother G.L. and, and teaching all of her, her uh, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And I'm so thankful to this church that in December of 2016, you recognized her for her, her teaching over 50 years. And if I'm not mistaken, it was probably the same class, same age group that she taught here. She was a lady of faith. She was also a, a family person. Perhaps the greatest gift that she could leave us outside of the, the uh, message of the Lord Jesus Christ is her example of loving her family. Norma shared um, a message on Facebook, on our family Facebook page uh, recently, and I asked her if I could share this with you. It was so... Uh, so poignant about her, her faith and her love for her family. Norma said, my heart is breaking tonight as my older sister, uh, as my only sister. I can't imagine her not being here close to me. I don't want her to suffer, but I may be a little selfish. I want her to stay. When she was in the nursing home, she would call me, and when she got through talking, she would always say, I love you, Norma. And I can say that that same thing happened. She would say, I love you, Jerry. And I'm sure she said, I love you, Jim. It was uh, very evident that she was a person of love. And those were the most beautiful words that will always be in my heart and mind. I desire your prayers that God will give me the strength to let her go when he calls her home. The last few years, we've been closer than we ever have been, and it's going to be hard to let her go, even though I know she'll be happy to be with mother and daddy and all the rest of the family that's already there waiting uh, for us there with our Jesus that she loves with all of her heart. And we all are going to miss her. I've seen... Uh, this, her family, her immediate family, connected in such a beautiful way over the past years. And the tears that we all have shared have come because of a deep love, a family love for sister. She's left that example that we all should follow of loving unconditionally. And, and we need to keep those memories close to our hearts and call on them. When we start missing our granny or we start missing mom or we start missing sister, there are those memories, memories that we saw on the screen during this visitation time, happy time, and that's what it gets us through. But she went out of this life into eternity. She felt, Pam, your love, because you were there, and Wimpy, you were there with her. She didn't have to go out alone because she had family, and I know that was important to her. Not only was she a, a family person and a, a, a faithful person, 
but she was also a friend. Some of you are here today because of uh, your friendship with her. Being a friend is a wonderful thing to say about a person. A few years ago in our staff meeting at church, I, uh, I told our staff some of the things that have been said about biblical characters, and we, uh, we went through those uh, together. Abraham was called a friend of God. David was a man after God's own heart. Peter was called the rock. And I believe that each of these descriptions would describe my sister. She was a friend of God. Her life and her faith showed that. She sought to know more and more about God. She wanted to please him. She was after his heart. And she was a rock. She was the foundation on which her children and her grandchildren uh, could build their lives because she had taught them that faith. And I wondered, what can we learn from her death that would help us as we move on into the future, a life without her? And I think there are three things that are very, very important about this time. One is that life is not easy. Life is not easy. Job chapter 14, verse 1 says that man who is born of woman is of a few days and full of trouble. The promise of scripture is that life is not going to be easy. And for that, uh, for sister, that scripture became a reality. She had to deal with an illness that left her unable to live life as she wanted to. And I know she wanted to go back home. She told me that she did and just live a normal life. And she didn't want to have to depend on others to take care of her. But for her, life had dealt a different blow. She wanted to come back to this church, Brother Steele. And she would tell me when I would call that she couldn't come to church. And it bothered her. She faced a lot of pain, medical procedures. And it just didn't seem fair. But Holy Scripture promises us that in this life, there will be troubles. You're going to face them. I'm going to face them. And the important thing to, is to understand uh, that how we deal with them matters. And she faced those difficult days with dignity and with victory. And she's experienced that victory today. So we learned that life is not easy. Also, life is not brief, or life is brief. James 4, 14 says, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is life? It's a vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes away. We're just not prepared for death to come into our families and take our loved ones. The sister's death shows us that life is brief. Psalm 144, verse 4 says, Life is like a breath, and our days are like a passing shadow. And we see that with our baby. And I've seen that today. I've seen some of, some of these children that are like this, and I'm thinking, that can't be possible. They're supposed to be like this. And we turn around and, and time just flies by. Life is quick. And with sister, her life was like a passing shadow. Those experiences that I was sharing earlier seemed like it was just a few years ago, but it was so far gone. It just life passes by, friends. And none of us is promised tomorrow. The Bible says it's appointed to man once to die, and after that, the judgment. And 
sister has just kept her appointment. We don't know when that's going to happen, but we do know, do know it's going to come. The life is brief. And perhaps the most important thing that we can learn is that opportunity is brief. I'm sure that some of you would like to have said uh, some things to her before she passed away, but that opportunity is gone. It's over. I think she would want you to take the opportunity you do have to tell those you love how much you love them. She would want you to live out that love and that faith in your life just as she did. She would want you to say, I love you more because that was important to her. I think she would want you to mend broken relationships and realize that, that it's, it's not good to hold on uh, to things. She would want you to smile. I know through the years she seemed to be a very serious person, but I love to hear her laugh. And she would want us to smile and to laugh. You see, we miss opportunities every day to do the important things that we later regret when we don't. So she would say, don't waste the opportunity you have. Opportunity is brief. So we have to seize when we can. We also learn from sister's death that faith is all we really have. She's a woman of faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19 says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. And if people just look at, at Christ as a checkoff where they can say, well, I went to church, or I did this, or I did that, the Bible says you're going to be most miserable. See, we walk by faith and not by sight. Our hope is not in, in this life, but our hope is in the one who saves us for eternity. Nicodemus came to Christ and asked that all-important question, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, you must be born again. He didn't say anything about church membership. He didn't say anything about denomination. He said, it's a heart matter. You must be born again. And John says in John chapter 3, that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And Sister learned early on that our salvation is in God's grace. As Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And she knew that in order to be ready for this day, she had to totally and completely Trust in the grace of God. And it would not be her good deeds, although they, she did them. But it would be God's grace that she believed in so strongly and she trusted that would get her into heaven. And I also believe that she would want you to be ready. She would want me to tell you don't waste those opportunities because you can see her again in eternity. The Bible teaches us that. So don't miss the opportunity to prepare yourself for the time when you get to this life where you pass from this life to the next. Be prepared. Don't waste that opportunity. There's a be beautiful poem that says, God saw you were getting tired and a cure was not to be. So he put his arms around you and whispered, come to me. 
With tearful eyes we watched you and saw you pass away. Although we loved you dearly, we could not make you stay. A golden heart, heart stopped beating, hard working hands at rest. God broke our hearts to prove to us he only takes the best. Father God, you are so gracious and kind and merciful. Lord, we thank you so much for the faith that sister had that assures her that when she left this life, you were waiting for her. God, I, I pray that these words will uh, touch our hearts. And Lord, if there's anyone here who is not a believer, not ready uh, for this day, I pray that they will not miss the opportunity to prepare so that, that they can have that reunion that we've talked about when their life comes to an end. Thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for comforting us as we've gone through these difficult days. And above all, Lord, we thank you uh, for sending Jesus to die on the cross and for being resurrected from that grave to assure us that there will be a great resurrection someday. So thank you, Lord. We love you. I pray comfort and peace to be upon this family. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trial should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my face shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trumpet shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well. With my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul.